This is Cohesion Connect with your host, Michelle Ricketts. Hello, I'm Michelle Ricketts and welcome to Cohesion Connect. I'm here with my special guest, Martin Ricketts. Hey, Martin. Hey, Michelle. How you doing? I am great and happy to be here with you today. It's a nice sunny day in Vancouver, Canada, and we're looking forward to this conversation. So today we're talking about something near and dear to my heart, sales, but more specifically, chasing sales and why that's a bad long-term strategy. So having over 35 years in sales in the corporate world myself, I've seen all different types of sales, all different types of salespeople, representatives, account executives, et cetera. And we definitely, definitely don't want to be chasing sales. So we're going to be talking more about that. Martin, when I say chasing sales, what does that mean to you? Yeah, well, you know, everyone starts this way typically. It's chasing sales means you're looking for leads and you're generating leads. There's lots of ways to do that. But the thing is, with most of those leads don't work out. So you ask, do you want to buy my stuff? No. Do you want to buy my stuff? No. Right. So it, everyone knows this in real estate. It can be up to 90 percent of the leads don't pan out. So it's a really inefficient way of generating business. It's transactional, but it's 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 transactional. But again, you haven't typically built trust and so most people say no it does work Absolutely. and it's a very short-term thing but it's transactional yes and in transactional sales i'd say when i was in the courier business that was more of a transactional even though i was working with corporates that was still more of a transactional encounter because it wasn't a high-end sale or, or high high ticket item my the rest of my career primarily with high ticket items you're developing that relationship so the want to buy this want to buy this as you were just talking about that's not what you're doing you're developing a relationship over time right right you know i i got a message on uh linkedin the other day from somebody you know out of the blue hey you want to buy youtube services uh no i said to him you have to build relationships he said oh that's what i'm doing okay that's not really the way it works the, the biggest problem with transactional sales is you're not building IP. And so it's very, very hard to step away from the business. Michelle, you talk about that a lot, right? Being able to have an independent business. You can't have an independent business very easily if you just do transactional sales. And you're not building your intellectual property, which is maybe you have an online course that people automatically go to and get content. So it's a very different strategy in the way that you generate sales but one is sustainable and can grow and the other is not. Absolutely. And my my most recent career with uh, 16 years in the credit card processing industry in the back end was really about that. You built long term relationships. Some of my longest relationships with potential clients were seven, eight. One of them, my, my deal that I did sign and it takes a village as to do that was nine years from prospect to actual client. It took nine years. And that was year after year, meeting with them, talking to them, keeping them informed of different things that were going on in the industry and making sure they knew what was up to date. In some cases, with some of my prospects, I had a better relationship with them than their actual account uh, that they were with. But because it's an industry that takes a lot of moving parts to move over, you just don't move over million dollar companies <laughs> at yeah. the drop of a hat. Yeah. So well, Michelle, it, it I takes thought time. That my my, my uh, sales cycle was long as over a year from some of the things we were doing. But listen, here's the thing. I get it. Right? It's hard to build infrastructure. It's just easier to go get leads and try to close them. Right. Mm -hmm. Where the other way, the way I'm talking about is you build systems that get people to over time get you to know, like, and trust you. And you do that by putting lots of content out on the internet. Anyone talk, links, uh, listens to Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks about this all the time. You should be posting multiple times a day across multiple platforms with specific context for each one. And then people will put up their hand and say, oh, that's interesting, I resonate with that, and they'll talk to you. They're coming to you, that's the attracting sales. But that takes time, mm -hmm. it's like a train. It, it doesn't happen right away. And you have to do a whole bunch Absolutely. of work first before you get there. But you know what? That's kind of the way it works with entrepreneurs. So Michelle, what yes. I recommend to people 
is that yeah they start maybe 90 percent of their time at the beginning is is transactional lead leads leads and trying to close them and then over time they start changing that and it's 10 percent um where you're creating content then it's 20. but ultimately you want to get to a point where your content creation and your marketing and your value proposition is independent of the sales and marketing funnel right which means if you took off a week it would still generate sales and the only mm. way to do that is to develop a presence and reach and revenue on social media by putting out content and then people will be attracted to that absolutely and social media but also some people are still doing it with email but in either case whatever platform you're using you're still reaching out to your potential customers, some I you know Joe Mark who likes to call them guests. You're still reaching out to them to add value and provide information and education, whatever they are looking for. And the ones that resonate with what you're saying, those are the ones that are going to reach out to you, and they're going to come to you opposed to you having to chase them. But it's all about that content and that IP that you're talking about developing that you need to utilize to be able to do that, right, Martin? That's right. And Michelle, you know, IP comes in a lot of forms, right? So putting out the content, that's to get the attraction. But then you have to have your course, your structure. Maybe it's an eight-week course. Maybe it's a experience event. But you really want to start building things that don't require you to be there. That's the only way that you can get a business that stands alone. And maybe you want to sell it later, and you can do that. But it's a hard process to do it, but the only way to do it is to develop your IP and your systems and your infrastructure, and that's what we help people do. Absolutely. I was just talking with a business broker who buys, helps helps uh, entrepreneurs buy and sell businesses, and uh, they did a, a, a webinar recently where they talked about that fact that without having those systems and processes documented, which is part of what I do with clients, Without having that, you're not able to, as you're talking about, step away, but you're also not able to sell it. And a lot of businesses today, a lot of entrepreneurs today think about, oh, they want to sell their business. They all have these sort of delusions of grandeur as I'm going to sell, yeah. make a million dollars or $10 million. But if you haven't set the business up correctly to do that with the IP that you're talking about, with the systems and the processes in place, it's not going to be ready to sell. And you're going to go and get that valuation and it's going to hit you in the face because it's much lower than what you had anticipated or yeah. what you were looking for. Yeah, right? or, it won't, or they won't do it at all. And if you don't have any infrastructure, then they won't do it. Here's the thing. If you can't walk away from your business for a week and it will still run, then you have a job, not a business. And mm -hmm. hey, that's that's harsh, but it's true. And the only way to get out of that trap, that change your death trap, is to create this IP and systems as we've been talking about. Right, Michelle? Absolutely. It really is being able to, to step away. I did an event series a while back called the Three Day Weekend Lifestyle. Because for a lot of entrepreneurs, thinking about stepping away is, oh my gosh, it's scary. It needs me. I need to do everything. So I used to say, okay, you start with the regular two-day weekend, then you add a day, you get a three-day weekend, then you add a day. But really, in essence, it's to be able to step away for whatever period of time. I was just speaking to a client who was able to set, step away for a week, go to Hawaii on an amazing vacation, the first time since COVID. And she was thrilled because we had worked together and put her systems processes in place documented that so she had that structure but she also has her ip so she has things that she's providing to clients that they can utilize without her and not being at the clinic and and she was just thrilled yeah you know what you also want to look at the long-term strategy and long-term approach because if you're not developing stuff for the long term then you won't get there and a lot of people, yeah, I know I have to do that. And putting stuff out on the internet, that's hard. It is hard. But you, it doesn't have to be a big production. You can just, well, we're doing a live right here, right now. We're going to take this and chop it up and make more content out of that. That's one of the best ways to do it. So find someone you can do a live with or a podcast and then chop that stuff up. But get started. That's the thing I really want to get people talking about. Yes, you might spend most yes. of your time doing the lead stuff. But get started on the long-term strategy of building your IP and your process. And it took me years to come up with our system, of which we're going to talk about today, Michelle, right? The, the, we have the five pillars, the, the prime directors. We have a whole bunch of systems and stuff, as does Michelle. But it took me years to develop that yes. stuff. And it does. It's not fast. But, you know, that's what it means to be an entrepreneur. 
it does take time and it's something I know I continue to work at because I was I was in corporate for most of my career. So the last three years is where I've started to build my own IP and be able to have others in my business and start to step away. So that's something that I continue to work on because I'm still new at it. But yeah. seeing how it worked in corporate is part of what helped me to be able to now be a consultant and work with clients and help them do the same thing, to be able to develop the systems and the IP and what you've done, Martin, so that you now have a business that works, as you like to say, sans you, <laughs> right? right. Um, so yeah, it really is about getting everything in place. And that key is developing that know, like, and trust. One of my clients keeps saying, Michelle, put yourself more into your, your social media. So you will still see that I'm starting to do that because it really is very important to get to know, like, and trust the person, the individual, and be able to see them in their your social media, your email campaigns, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, any final thoughts on this, Martin? No, I think that the, the thing I want to encourage people to do is just get started. Like I said, get started putting something out there. I had to, you know, I'm from the older generation, just be fun, what generation X, I guess. Um, I wasn't that real comfortable with putting stuff out on, on Facebook. It's just not my thing. I got comfortable with it. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're in business and you, you, know, you don't like doing that, well, too bad. I don't like doing bookkeeping either, but you have to do it. <laughs> so you learn <laughs> to do it. There's nothing more I can say. The, the thing that you need to do is put stuff out. You need to learn to do it and you, over time, change your mindset. Okay, it's not so bad. Oh, it's a good way of getting my clients. Whatever it is you need to do to change your mindset, but just do it. Absolutely. And part of enjoying what we do every day is doing the things you like, but there are things that you have to do. And I will say using a bookkeeper <laughs> much better than doing it yourself. And Martin's starting to do that as oh, yeah. well. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really moving those things you don't like to do off your plate. But being able to be present on your social media and start to develop content and your systems and your processes, it's a little challenging at first, but as you get into it and as you see the benefits of it, that's where it becomes an absolute win for you to be able to then step away and your business work without you. So you no longer have a job, you actually have a business. And so we want to provide some tools and tips as we go along and now we're going to get into some of that with martin he's going to give us our quick tips Yay. okay so the first quick tip is about naming files so data management is our theme for today and that's a broad spectrum of things that you can do but what's really important is to be able to find stuff people spend 25 percent of the time looking for things and not being able to find it you really want to be able to find it. So naming files is super important. And there's three parts to it that we typically look at. We use keywords in the name. Okay, so keyword is, if you took a, a picture of the Empire State Building, Empire State Building is a keyword, but you have to put the whole thing. You could put Empire and BLD for building or something like that. So you want to shorten it. So keywords is really good. Aspect ratio. Is it a 16 by 9 wide? Is it a square 1 by 1? Or is it a 9 by 16? And you just put 9x16, 1x1. That's the second thing we put in there. And the third thing is a version number. We lost a job once because we sent the wrong version of the file to a client. It was $10,000 we lost. So I've never done it since wow. then. So we always end with VER01 or 02. Okay? So version number is really important. Most people don't name their stuff. But then they spend that 25% of their time not finding it. So take the 10 seconds to name your files, especially if it's things you're using in social media and stuff. I can, that is so critically important. It's probably the number one thing you can do to save more time so that you're not looking for stuff. But it's one of those things, as Einstein says, a clever person solves a problem. A wise person avoids it in the first place. You can avoid losing things by naming them. Right, Michelle? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And Martin, I know you're not a fan of, of email unless it's the right tool for the job at the time. But I will say also for emails, I don't know how many times in corporate I received a note from a client that had either my company name as the subject line or theirs as a subject line. And if you think about it, if that stream changes or have if you have to search for an email later on, that as a subject line is absolutely useless. So yeah, to, to the same vein as naming files, if you're, if you're someone who still uses email, 
you make your subject lines effective. And even if you're doing a, a meeting and you give somebody the invite for the meeting, don't you don't need to put the word meeting in there. They know it's a meeting. Tell them what it's about. So it's discussion to for revenue generation. It's a uh, in discovery conversation. Put what it is and you can put the person's name as well. And I even like to put the uh, time for the time zone that I'm in. But make things descriptive like you're saying, so that it's important for finding things and you don't lose whatever it is. Yeah, that's right, Michelle. And it really is everywhere. Email, files that you use, things that you download, which brings me into the next one, Michelle, which is our in-transfer system. Now, we have a structure we use for folders, and this is universal, whether you have a Mac, a PC, whatever you do. And we've simplified, I spent a lot of time figuring this out, okay? So we use three folders for our primary data. The first one's called on deck. And what is that is, is anything you download from the internet goes in on deck. Because that's one of the problems. People don't know where to put stuff, okay? So put it in on deck. Now, once you know you want to do something with that, it's going to go to production, it's going to get posted, then we have a drawer called ongoing work. And in ongoing work, you put folders. So not files, folders. And a folder will contain everything you want for that job. Now, Windows doesn't structure it that way. They give you a video folder and this and this this. Don't use that. You want to have one folder. The job's called, um, I'm, I'm stuck on the Empire State Building for some reason. I think I'm going to say that. Empire State Building job. Okay. So then in there goes the graphics. We have subfolders in that folder. In fact, what we do is we make a template folder and then we copy it and we rename it to whatever the job is. And then in there, you've got your images folder, your video folder, your B-roll folder, so on and so forth. You can do it with audio folder, whatever you want. And then you just copy that every time and it's got the folders in it. So something gets downloaded, goes in on deck. Now you want to do something with it. You create one of those folders, like I just said, in ongoing work and you put it in ongoing work. The third folder, Michelle, is content bank. Content bank, as the word bank suggests, is your IP. So your logos and your background you use and all of that kind of stuff that you use internally goes in content bank. Those three folders dictate anything that comes in is going to go into one of those. It, first, it comes into to on deck. Then if it's a job, it goes into ongoing work. And if it's something for you, it goes into content bank. And then the final one we use is called in transfer. And this is a really special system for us because it's how we do, how we send things to people. So in transfer folders called IN, small IN, transfer, all caps. And so it's universal across Digital Samurai. Everyone has that folder. Michelle has that. All of our clients do. So if I'm going to send her something, I'm going to put it in transfer. And then she's going to move it out of in transfer. So here's the important point. In transfer must stay empty most of the time, right? Just like your mailbox or mailbox on the farm the, you know, the mailman puts the mail in, they puts the flag up, and then the person goes and gets the mail. 23 hours of the day, that box is empty. And when he goes to get the mail out of that box, there's no chance that he's not going to get it because that's the only thing in there. Same thing here. So you send somebody, somebody it's in, in transfer, and then they take it out. There's no chance they're going to lose it as an attachment. There's no chance they're going to misunderstand which one it is. Okay? So as opposed to sending it as an attachment to an email or anything else, use this folder structure. So again, Michelle, we've got on deck, that stuff coming in, ongoing work for any jobs, and those are in folders, and then content bank for your stuff, and in transfer for sending things around, and in transfer always has to be empty. Excellent. And those are all really, really valuable, Martin. I will say my favorite of your protocols there is in transfer because we use that and it makes such a difference of when you're going to get something or send something. I know it's going to be in transfer and that's where I'm grabbing it from. And you know the same if I'm giving you something. So there's none of this back and forth attaching everything and craziness exactly. that most people really go through. Between and these two things, naming files and putting them in this structure that we just said, that will save you a ton of time. We just we don't have yeah. any problems. We never lose attachments, and we can always find job stuff because it's in the job folder. And we're very mm -hmm. militant. I am anyway. I'm very militant about making sure clients and internal staff put stuff in the job folder. Right? This is that thing. It takes a little bit of effort, but it saves you a tremendous amount of time. This you know this is one of the things that's really important to encouraging kids. There's the marshmallow test. I'm not going to get to it too far, but basically it's. Well, do you want a marshmallow now or two marshmallows tomorrow? 
The kids that say they want two marshmallows tomorrow tend to do better in life, which is surprising. You can Google that. There's a whole study around it. But the same here. You do something now, name the files, put them in the folders. That will save you time later. It's a discipline. But if it's easier, yes. which it is, then you'll do it. And it does make such a difference. And it's it, it and it is a bit tedious at first. You think, oh, I've got to follow that protocol and put it in. But over time, it does save lots of lots of time. And what's our third tip, Martin? The third tip is using Google Photos. So again, in the theme of trying to find stuff, um, we put our graphics or videos and all that stuff in Dropbox and Google Photos, and sometimes also in um, G Form. I mean, not G Form, Google Drive, which is part of yeah. the Google Workplace Suite. The, the unique difference with Google Photos is it uses Google's machine learning. So I, say, I always say to me, if you've named them, that's great, but sometimes you still might not remember what it's called, okay? Or, so if you remember what it is, or if you remember where it is, then you can go and search because you have the name. But if you remember what it is, it's a picture of a horse, or it's me standing behind a boat. Then you can use Google Photos and machine learning. You can just type in boat, and it will find all the pictures with the boat. It doesn't matter if it's actually got boat in the name because it's using the picture and machine learning to look at it. It's an exceedingly efficient way of finding stuff. And quite frankly, most of the time, I don't necessarily remember where it is. Even for this live today, these graphics that you saw, I knew where, what they were. So I just went and searched for them in Google Photos and just downloaded them again. Now, I, I'll probably delete them after because I have them somewhere else, but it's really fast for finding things, right? So. And don't worry about having things in two places because, you know, hard drives are cheap. Like you can get a terabyte for less than a couple hundred dollars. It's just not a thing. So don't worry about having things in multiple places. I have, we have things in multiple places. It's also backed up. So it'll go to the hard drive, which will put it in Dropbox, and it'll also upload it to Google Photos, as I just said, so I can look for it in either place. But using Photos machine learning to look based on what it's, the picture is way easier. Absolutely. And you can use Google Photos as well. When you're taking photos on your phone, you can have it set up so that it automatically set, puts it into Google Photos. So then you have things there. And as you said, you can search in Google Photos the same way you would just search Google in the in the search bar to put in what it is you're lo looking for. I mean, I can put in Martin and it'll find him because <laughs> it knows who he is. Exactly. So yeah, really, yeah. really great. Great for that and being able to look at you uh, and utilize Google Photos. So now, Martin, all of those, let's just summarize again for the three tips. Naming files with the keywords, version numbers, and aspect ratio. Using the in-transfer system, using the on-deck, ongoing work, content bank, and in-transfer for transfer system. If you want more info on these, if you want more info on these, just DM us and we can send you more info on them. And finally, using Google Photos and its machine learning for look for stuff in the picture rather than trying to search and find it. Excellent. And those are all great tips. And again, if you want more information on it, just DM us or make a comment and we will reach out to you and be able to send you more. So now we're going to go into Martin micro lesson. Okay, so today's micro lesson is about data management, as we said, and Cohesion has the five pillars of productivity, moving to the cloud, data management, business communications, privacy and security, and digital agility. We did move into the cloud last week, so data management, we're gonna talk a bit more about that today. And the real important thing to remember when it comes to uh, data management is using the right tool for the job. I've talked about a couple of them already here, and so the next thing you wanna do is we, we want to figure out which tool you want to use for what, right? It's like if you use a hammer for everything, well, you're not going to do very well. And so the tool we use for capturing information is Google Keep because it captures information. You can just click on it. It'll save a website. You can do an audio note. You can do a text note, a list, or even a drawing. And most importantly, you can do that really fast. And that's the most important part, that it allows you to do it fast so you can take so that... You capture an idea, oh yeah, but, and then you can do that. That's really important because you know creativity is, is organic and can't be planned, so you, you need to be able to quickly capture that, not try to have to analytically think how something works. Number two, Michelle, is Google Drive. 
You use Google Drive in a different way than I do, Michelle, to a degree, but tell us about how you use Google Drive. So um, for me, Drive, I don't, I don't think I really use it differently, but I do make sure that I've got everything in Drive, knowing where I want to use it. So I don't think I really use it differently to well, most you don't, you, people. Well, you use folders. I don't use folders, but um, ah. yeah. Google Drive is great because it comes with Google's office suite, you know, Word and spreadsheets and all of those kind of things. And it's got fantastic mm. collaborative tools. We use it for managing data that is originating in Google Drive. Now, we don't download the, the, the files and then print them out and send PDFs. We just don't do that. If you're doing a doc, use a dynamic link and send the link because then you can change it and update it if you need to. Whereas if you send a PDF, it's static. So using dynamic documents with Google Drive is one of the best ways to use that. The next tool we use is called Dynalist. Dynalist is, as it suggests, for lists. So you want to use Dynalist if you have a, a structure you need to create that has sub-independencies of children, things like that. It's really good for structuring ideas and coming up with processes. All of our processes and protocols started with a Dynalist before we went to make and make list martin it's almost a little bit like mind map some people are more familiar with mind mapping and it's, it's yeah. similar those but are actually two tools that are complementary because the dying list gives you structure on a b c d e and dependencies but the but the mind map also gives you structure with visuals but it also gives you um loops if thens so if they do this yeah. then it goes back to do that which you can't do with dying yeah. list so we do them both, right. and that's actually a good point, Michelle. We use um, uh, Dynalist first, then we use uh, Mind Map. The right. next tool is Dropbox. I talked about that a fair amount. We use that to mirror our drive so that basically everything that's on your drive is in Dropbox. That means it's all instantly shareable through a link and, and so on and so forth. Plus, it's also instantly backed up. And then the final tool is Trello. Trello doesn't exactly fit into this, but this is more like um, job management, but it is mm -hmm. data. And we use Trello as the central place for a particular job so that the link to the documents there telling what to do, the link to the dining list is on the Trello card telling you uh, other things. The link to the Dropbox um, job folder in ongoing work is also on there, right? So using this best tool for the job, which is prime directive number three, by the way, makes it so that you're going to lower friction, right? Because you can use Docs for basically most of the stuff I just said there, Google Docs, but it's not the best way to do it. Certainly not the best way to do lists, right? So you really do want to use the best tool for the job. And we've thought that out and we have best practices around how to use all of those tools. So again, if you want more information on that, we can send you out just DM us. All right. And so that's, so that's cool. Google Keep, that's Dynalist, that's mind mapping, Trello. I think I missed one in there, Martin. Uh, Google Drive. Drive, and yes. And, and Google yes, Drive and Dropbox work, some, work together. If you want to know more, some people say, why do you need to do both of those? If you DM me and you're interested in that, I can give you more deep dive into it. But trust me, there's very specific reasons why we use both of those things. And it really is for a lot of people too, they'll always say, okay, you're talking about all these tools. Where can I find them? When you're in and you're doing a search, if you've got any, any Google uh, search page open or most of the Google pages, you see those three dots. We refer to them as the Rubik's cube. That's where you get all your Google tools, right, yeah. Martin? Yeah. Yeah. The nine dots, the nine dots, Rubik's the, cube. But yeah, you go into there and you, and you can access the Google tools from there. Excellent. So this has been some great micro lesson or great micro lesson talking about data management and the different elements that make that up. We're going to continue to go through the, the five pillars with you that Digital Samurai has. Um, that we've done the first one is in one of our previous episodes and you can look for that on uh, my LinkedIn page, my brother's LinkedIn page or you, my YouTube as well. And this is pillar number two that we're doing today. And we'll continue to go through these, maybe not necessarily all in a row, but we will uh, continue to go through all of them for you. We're also going to be sharing the rest of the journey as we go along and as we guide entrepreneurs to develop their IP and monetize their story while we're empowering a million African youth entrepreneurs. For Michelle Ricketts and Martin Ricketts, the twins, thanks for joining us today. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.